Good afternoon, uh, Moira Dayton from the Association of Secondary Teachers. Uh, I have two rather different questions for the panel. Uh, what, the first one would be to pick up on the theme of social partnership. Uh, I would be very interested um, to hear you speak about the role of the teacher unions in framing education policy and in the broader, I suppose, for want of a better expression, reform movement in education in your countries. Uh, and the second question then is about language teaching in your education system. I mean, even from your own presence today, you are indicating an extraordinary degree of, of um, uh, language talent. I was walking uh, in Dublin the other day, and there was two lovely little children in front of me speaking lovely English. And I said, are you having a nice day off from school? Thinking they were Irish children. And they turn around and says, no, we're on holidays with our daddy, we're from Norway. <laughs> so I was rightly put back in my box with two seven-year-olds being so fluent. Uh, so uh, apart, aside from that little anecdote, perhaps you could tell us about how your education systems have managed to produce incredibly good linguistic skills among your young people and um, where you would see your curriculum and your pedagogy as going in that respect. Thank you. Precious to us, a member of the, the task forward. And just quickly, to what extent do um, the Department of Education in the Nordic countries coordinate with each other uh, in terms of uh, policy? And to what extent does the um, European Union, which hasn't been mentioned at all in this debate so, so far, to what extent do they uh, uh, come into the process? Now, I understand there are some of the member states in the Nordic Council are not members of the European Union, but nevertheless there, there, there are requirements there in terms of the economic area arrangements. Thank you. And there's gentlemen up here. The Minister mentioned the prohibitive costs. Your name? Oh, sorry, Robin Wilson, the big one. Um, the Minister mentioned the prohibitive costs in the current context, particularly for more disadvantaged parents of school uniforms. I wonder if you ask if in Finland, Denmark, or Iceland, anyone bothers with school uniforms? <laughs> okay, well, is the panel ready to take a couple of those questions? First, Marta's question about the role of the teachers' unions in social partnership. Uh, would anyone like to take that? Yes, I think that the, the role of teachers' unions uh, is quite important in a system like ours. It's so decentralized so uh, that any initiative, if you want it sort of to be really sort of spelled out into a new practice. If this is not at least to some extent supported by the teachers' union, our experience is that then in many places nothing happens. So they have a really important impact on the implementation of new ideas and new initiatives. And therefore it's, we also think it's quite important to try to have them on board in a, some kind of partnership approach. We have examples where they have been in opposition and it took many years before uh, new things were really implemented at the school level. And then to the, to the language teaching, I think I can remember when English uh, was introduced in Danish primary education in rural areas. I grew up in a rural area, and that was in 1960. Uh, and since 1960, every school in Denmark had to teach English from grade four uh, and throughout the rest of, the, uh, of your school time. So, and nowadays we have uh, we, we are starting English teaching actually in, in, sometimes in grade one, sometimes in grade two. That depends a bit on on the local uh, authorities if they are going to give money for it. But, but so you have, English is, is taught from a very early day, and then also you you are taught another foreign language as well. Uh, traditionally it was German, but then nowadays you more or less have a free choice. So it can be Spanish or Chinese or uh, Japanese for that matter. And right. you're right, we don't worry about school uniforms. <laughs> okay. um, the, the question, did you want to say something on those particular topics, Christina? Yes, all yes. Sure. Uh, I, I, and and we, we, we might go on to the question about uh, the, department, the degree of coordination between the different departments of education and the role of the EU, if any. But oh. take it as you wish, yeah. Okay, well I can also answer something in relation to Nordic collaboration. Um, we cherish and uh, there are different sorts of uh, mechanisms such as Nordic Council of Ministries but also uh, uh, different exchange programs 
uh, for schools, uh, teacher education programs, and uh, for continuing teacher education uh, programs uh, where Nordic teachers, students, schools collaborate with each other at the very concrete levels too. Uh, and uh, of course we are very interested to develop uh, at least the uh, frameworks and common core values for the Nordic countries together. Uh, our societies are now a little bit different. For example, in Finland, uh, our number of uh, children having a multicultural background is not so great at the moment than it is, in, for example, in Denmark, Sweden or Norway. But definitely it is increasing and there is, for example, a good space for collaboration and sharing of your experiences with Finland, how to, how to be ready. Uh, for changes, for such changes. Um, I would also like to add a little bit, very, very quickly, that teacher education union or teacher unions are an important part of our system and, and we need to collaborate together because if we do not and if there are great conflicts of interest, uh, developing the futures for education may be totally, uh, it, it is impossible without the cooperation and shared understanding uh, why change may be needed. Um, and teacher unions are very important also in generating uh, public discourses around education. Uh, so they are important part of our system. Our language programs are also very rich and we emphasize them in our curriculum. Uh, learning English or Swedish usually begins uh, at the age of eight grade three and the variety of other languages is pretty good. Now in these uh, economically uh, challenging times some municipalities may have not been able to recruit a Spanish teacher or, or these um, uh, other languages uh, and that well I think the same applies uh, with the EU that I was describing with, with the Nordic collaboration. There is a lot of going on in terms of exchanges and also development and research programs that EU is funding, strengthening collaboration and innovation and so, yes. Okay, we might leave that, for, um, did you have something in particular to say, Esther? Because I see lots of people are signaling here <laughs> that they want to get in. No, I, I will be uh, very, very brief. Uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, the language skills, of course, for a country, uh, I mean, we are 300,000 people. Nobody else understands our language, so we are more, we more or less have to. So a lot of time is devoted to this in, uh, in Icelandic classrooms. We learn English and Danish in compulsory school. Uh, the, uh, on the Nordic uh, cooperation, I think Christina has, uh, has uh, told you about that, but for those who are interested, you can just uh, log on to Norden.org, Norden.org, and there you will find information about the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nordic Council and the complicated system of working groups and auto groups and what have you on different aspects of edu education. We are not EU members, but I would still like to comment. Okay, by all means. Because uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have in Iceland, I would say that the reform in 2008 was large, largely influenced by EU work being done at the time. And some parts of it actually have been implemented in Iceland such as the European Qualifications Framework. We have now developed our own national framework, which has a clear reference to that. So we participate in development at EU level, and uh, I think that uh, when it comes to the quali Qualifications Framework, we have actually done quite well, even though Icelanders are not allowed to boast anymore. <laughs> I think uh, this, is, uh, this is one success that, that we have made. Uh, school uniforms are uh, not an issue back home. All right, Minister, Minister for an excellent paper and for each of our participants for a wonderful learning session. Thank you very much. Very quickly, uh, just a few points uh, by way of a comparative analysis, but maybe also a little quick input. In relation to a gender analysis that most of uh, our participants have spoken of, Boys also in our society and in the school system are not doing so well. And I just wonder if 
anybody has really applied the research, for example, of somebody like the philosopher Lucy Rigoret, who in her education work has clearly proven that girls and boys, men and women, learn differently. And if we have a society and a school system that don't take that into account and don't take proven research in that matter into curriculum and methodologies and pedagogies of teaching, I think this problem is going to get worse. Secondly, I wonder if the panel and the minister has done tremendous work in really opening up this conversation in our society. Have what we have in our society at present, which is a grave clash of understanding in relation to values. While everybody is talking about inclusion, we have a system in our society and in our schools where the Catholic Church's beliefs intrude on the state's beliefs in relation to inclusion. And the gay issue, the gay and lesbian issue, is a clear example of that. No more need be said now, but you can have boys, gay and lesbian young people in our schools who at state level are being told they can now celebrate partnership in their adult life, but in the school system that is managed uh, by a patronage of the Catholic Church, they are being told that in fact if they uh, live faithfully to their intimacy of love for each other, they are, and this is to quote the church documents, committing an evil act. Now these young people are trying in their consciousness and in their identity to sort that out in our schools. And sometimes we wonder why there are such great problems, especially among boy children. I could go on, but I'll end quickly. We, like many people here, except one of the speakers in the afternoon, have a greatly revered teaching um, force, if you like, uh, our, our people going into teaching are of the highest caliber uh, academically. My, having worked in teacher education all my life, the one um, concern I have often had is why those who come to teaching with such high academic caliber don't exit the teaching profession uh, into the teaching profession from teacher training as hugely creative, imaginative teachers. So many uh, leave with mediocre results in teaching practice. So I feel there needs to be a huge emphasis on training the imagination for the future of the young teachers of Ireland. And that should be really rewarded. Okay, Rick at all. I won't at this point, but there will be another session later on and we have a chance to pick up. Would anybody like to respond to, uh, to um, Anne Louise there? And could I ask the Minister if at this point he'd like to respond first on any aspect of it? Because he didn't get a chance the last time. You're all right. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Just briefly, as briefly as you can, yeah. please. Yes, the, the gender differences. I, I would like to be a bit more precise on how that looks in Denmark. Uh, it is so that, that at the end of basic education, we have a gender difference which is quite significant among ethnic minority students. It's quite significant in special needs students, that much more boys in special needs education than, than girls. But among the rest, gender differences are quite small. Boys are doing a little better than girls in math, and a little worse in Danish and foreign language. But the differences are not that, uh, are not that big. So I think that really, but we then see much more gender difference in our secondary education. So it's not just to do with the performance of basic education. There is something else uh, in play there, which we don't exactly understand what it is, but something happens in the transition from basic education to upper secondary education that we do not fully understand. I am also very pleased that in Finland uh, educational policy making and makers have started to take seriously this research how boys are doing at school and how we need to actually think about the pedagogies, activities, learning environments that uh, allows every children, every student to flourish and recognizes the, like, that there is flexibility. So one, doesn't, one size does not fit everyone. So th that is a very wonderful message. And no, now it's not only researchers, but 
policy makers who are integrating these ideas into curriculum and recommendations. And so this is a big step well, ahead. I think I would like to comment that, but thank you. Your other comments were excellent and interesting. Uh, yes, uh, just, very, just very briefly, uh, on the issue of, of gender difference, differences in learning, uh, this has, uh, let's say, not reached the main, let uh, the uh, government schools yet, or the mainstream uh, curriculum yet, but there is uh, the, uh, the most popular private compulsory school back home is actually based on the on this principle to a certain extent, which means that at parts during the day, the two sexes are separated <coughs> to learn uh, separately, while other parts of the day they spend together. And uh, there is a website in English, and I could uh, give it to you later on uh, for further information. Thank you very much. It's now 13.45. We've, we have a quarter of an hour. Professor Kathleen Lynch will speak at, at uh, the beginning of the next session, which will be promptly at 3 o'clock. Promptly. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.